Hey, good morning and welcome back everybody to another episode of the Nonprofit Show. We're really excited about this because we have an expert about grant writing on Libby Highkinds, who's joining us, the founder and CEO of Grant Watch. Welcome, my new best friend. Thank you so much. So, so nice to be here with you today. Well, you know, anyone that's called the queen of grants is a new best friend for me. It's remarkable how that name stuck and it became a book. <laughs> Well, we're going to hear more about that. And I am very excited to talk with you, Libby, because while I've never been a professional grant writer as a volunteer in my community and a board member, I've been asked to volunteer in the process of grant writing and um, without being fully trained or anything. And I think that a lot of the things that you're going to talk about today were kind of some of the directions that I was always told not to take, not to go down that path. And so I can't wait to hear how you've kind of flipped this around and uh, I think for the better. So this is going to be a, a wonderful conversation for so many of us. You know, another wonderful thing about the nonprofit show is we have amazing partners. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraisers Friday, our new episode on Fridays, just dedicated to fundraising and your part-time controller. These are the folks that join us day in and day out. We also have an amazing group of co-hosts. I'm flying solo today with Libby, and I hope that over the last couple of months, you've been able to get to know them. They come from all over the country. They're extremely diverse in the parts of the nonprofit sector that they serve, and they are just magical thinkers. So we are thrilled to have them uh, with us every day. Just like we're thrilled to have Libby Highkind, founder and CEO of Grant Watch. But my, I, I'm going to say today, more importantly, the queen of grants, from teacher to grant writer to CEO, you have a book out and it's really interesting. I love it. I love it. Talk to us about your book and what we can expect if we if we purchase it. I should say when we purchase it. <laughs> when? Okay. Well, it's really gotten a great reception uh, yeah. for a first time author. I have sold 478 books since okay. February 1st. I think that's, for me, I didn't expect it. So for me, it's great. Maybe other people sell more. Um, let me just start for a minute how I got this name, the Queen of Grants. Yeah. I was on another podcast uh, and years ago, and I was introduced as the Queen of Grants. <laughs> And then it's it's just started to stick. And then when I wrote the book and we were looking for a title, it just that was it. I love it. So that's that's where that's where I'm at. If you look at the cover of the book, um, there are hearts all over yeah. the book, and that's because I sincerely believe that your passion is so important when you're writing a book, um, when you're writing a grant, and also when you're writing a book. But when you're writing a grant your passion has to jump off the page and the reader has to sort of buy into what you're saying and they don't buy into it if it's just clinical, right? If it's just this, this, the, these are the needs, bum, 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 bum. and there's a bunch of statistics. But if you have the community on board for whatever your grant is, if you have other stakeholders on board, if you can show that everybody's jumping in with your passion, then every the reader is like, I'm joining too. And this is a great idea. So this is why I wanted to talk to you because I mentioned this to you in the green room. And that is that when I, you know, as a vol community volunteer, um, as a board member and just involved in other organizations, there have been times when I've been asked to write a grant or participate in it. And that was always one of the knocks was take out the passion, make it clinical. Exactly what you said. Um, don't communicate the the temper and the, the, the tenor of the group. Just go with the, the hard facts and stats. So that's why I was so fascinated to get you on the nonprofit show because I, I am much more inclined to communicate 
like you're you're saying. So let's start with what the PMF grant approach is. So there's a place for the clinical part mm -hmm. and a place for the passion. So when you talk about organizational capacity, organizational strength, and when you talk about the need. That's where your passion comes in and your backstory, the backstory of the organization, the mission, the vision, everything goes there. Okay. And then if you're if they ask a question or if there's an opportunity to add who else is joining you in the program, because you're going to mention you might be mentioning them in the budget. You might be adding the uh, memorandums of understanding. So you want to mention them. So you always have to find a place where it belongs. So. Passion Maps and Folders, PMF, came about because I, we, I hired a um, public relations company. And at the drop of a hat, I mean, gee, I was having a blood test. And I was at the lab. And I get a call, Libby, are you available? We need you on television in the next hour. And she taught me, you never say no to press. You just never say no. You figure it out. You never say no. Right. And... <laughs> You know, I also learned that I can't look at notes while I'm speaking. You want to see my eyes. You want to see my face. You want to see me smile, right? Mm -hmm. So how can I do this when I get on? There's a, a mic in front of me, and I'm, I can't do a hum, a hum, a hum, a hum, you know, like on the honeymooners, right? I can't do that. <laughs> so I had to figure out how am I going to remember everything I want to say. Mm -hmm. That's how I got PMF passion maps and folders, and it's everything I want to say, except for uh, check your eligibility and follow directions. Everything else is basically in there. <laughs> maybe sustainability, re replicability, um, maybe that's not in there, but passion maps and folders says it all. So let me take you there. Um, okay, so passion, jump off the page. Find every place you can insert it, but at the same point, your grant is an elevator pitch, right? Let's say somebody calls me up and says, Libby, can I talk to you for a minute? And I'll, you know, I, I take these calls and they want to tell me what they need a grant for. And the conversation is going on and on and on and on. That's not what we need. You need to have your elevator pitch and your passion has to be in there. And all this extraneous stuff, and that's what I think you were taught. Don't put anything into your grant application that's not the point of your grant application. Okay, if we're talking about, and I always go back to preschool because it was you know, early on in my career. If we're talking about a preschool, the only reason you're going to mention your high school students in the community is because you want to show why we need a preschool. Mm -hmm. Don't give me the stats about high school, um, English and Shakespeare because it has nothing to do with the preschool. But if you're saying uh, that how you want to do, um, you want the high school students to read to the preschool students and you have set aside time for that, yes, that's why you would mention it, right? You want to increase uh, preschool early childhood development because you're noticing in the high school that the reading levels are not as high and the best practices show that we should um, uh, ha have a more robust preschool education. Okay, so that's why you would mention high school, but you won't mention it for any other reason. And even though your passion is about high school, you know, stifle it. Okay, so that that's where I think everybody told you as a volunteer, don't put everything in because people put everything in but the kitchen sink into the need statement. So, if, right now, if you're a reader and you're reading everything but the kitchen sink or the kitchen sink, you're confused. Yeah. Because when you read the needs statement, you should already have in your mind, wow, we have to fix this. This is what we have to fix, right? Okay. So let's go. Passion, maps, and folders. So what's a map? When I think of a map, I think in terms of Excel, a spreadsheet. And I say, line things up. If you have a need, then you have to have a goal. If you're mentioning a need, then there has to be a goal. And it has to pertain to the mission and vision of the funding source. Mm -hmm. So if their mission and vision is not what you're interested in, why are you applying for the grant? Right. 
Okay. <laughs> you, and you, thank you, you know, Libby, thank you for saying that because I think a lot of times and, and, and this is um, an aside to get your opinion on this. You know, we just think, Oh, there's, there's money, there's funding. And we don't stop and say, will this be a good fit? Right. But even, and, and even if let's say it is a good fit. Okay. Understand that when you write a grant for an organization, the entire organization is busy with that application because you need these stats, you need those stats. Um, you need budget numbers so that so the, you're, you're dealing with your budget office. You need your organizational capacity. You're dealing with people that have been there for a long time. There's so much happening. Why are you starting this proposal if you don't have enough time to finish it? And if it's not a good fit, why are you doing this? Because all you're doing is disrupting the organization. And then the next time when there's a grant application, that's really the best fit. You're not going to want to go through it again. It's painful. Yeah. I, you know, I love that you put it in that context because I don't think that's something we think about. I think that we're generally just all into the, the task of meeting a deadline and getting it going. And we don't think out. And, and forecast out about what the implications are. Um, let's get back into this. The passion is a critical element. Um, when you're talking about that, what does it look like? Is it a narrative of, of talking about like storytelling or is it just using vocabulary, a certain vocabulary? Like how do we communicate that? You can communicate it by with with a quote from the parent okay. um you know or it's whoever if you're dealing with veterans a quote from them what they feel is needed or how your organization has helped in the past but needs expansion so you can take it away from you saying we need we need we need you can bring people in you can talk about a survey that you did so it's not just um the numbers from the local community um, or the local community organization that produces these stats. Uh, you could, of course, bring in the census, but you you just, it's just your writing. It has, it's, it has to come like from somewhere. There has to be heart in it. Uh, I always tell people if you're hiring a grant writer and let's say you want them to write an application for Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. you want to make sure that grant writer has someone in their family that mm -hmm. has suffered from it. Or they did some volunteer work somewhere. They have something that's going to make them really enthusiastic about writing the proposal. Mm -hmm. Because that will come off the page. That, yeah. that's, and, you know, if you use AI for this part, it's not going to help. It's going to actually hurt you because it's going to be too dry. And, yes, you can say, give it to me more engaging. Do a little better job. But if your initial heart and soul is not in it, it's seen. And yesterday I interviewed a funding source and they told me that they get a lot of grants that sound the same. So that's wow. how they know there's a lot of AI. But they int actually do interviews and site visits before they fund. Right. So right. people, you're not going to get away with AI. <laughs> just to let you know, you're not finished just because you submit a proposal in many instances. So the backstory of the organization is very important. Also, what if um, the organization started because somebody, uh, it's for, uh, people, adults with disabilities, right? Maybe somebody in the family had a situation and realized the services weren't available in their community. That's a great backstory to put in. That's how the passion comes off the page. Mm -hmm. You know, I never thought about this, Libby, until you just mentioned this about the continuity of that grant application being reflective across the campus, the offices, the staff, um, because so many program officers didn't visit. They held back because of the pandemic. Now they're going back out. They're creating more personal relationships. And I think you bring up a really good point is that if that narrative and that grant application has one tone, it's not replicated on site, there's a mismatch. Yeah, and if you have different people within the organization writing sections, you can feel it as you're going through. So somebody has to be responsible for the overall writing. 
and yeah. and it's has to be in one voice so that that's that's where the passion comes in and it's important to get other stakeholders in the community into your application mm -hmm. everybody wants to uh, fund something that's really going to make a difference. And when you hear that, there are people giving you letters of support. And a letter of support shouldn't just be, I support so-and-so because they're a great organization. That's not enough. It should be more about, in our support is going to include uh, in-kind contribution or in-service mm -hmm. contribution. Right, yeah. Um, really, I, I almost want to say, you know, in the old fashioned way, you know, locking arms, like mm -hmm. we're, we're right. marching along this path. Um, again, Libby, you're blowing my mind here because this is not the way I was taught. And what you're saying makes so much more sense because ultimately I believe what you're saying in your direction is that it creates a relationship, whether it's real or perceived. And, you know, we know that that's how we keep donors. That's how we keep stakeholders when there's the sense that they're joining the cause. And the funder becomes your new relationship, your new best friend, because yeah. once you get funded, you're going to send them pictures, uh, videos, and you're going to at them in social media. This is what we're doing with the money that we got from XYZ Corporation. Mm -hmm. That's how it works. Yeah. So this, this just everybody needs to be excited. It's not about the bottom line. It can't be. Because if it is, nobody's going to nobody's gonna join your cause. It's more about how many people can you serve? How are you going to make a difference in the world? Mm -hmm. That's wow. what nonprofits are all about. Yeah. I, I, man, I am really intrigued by this because, um, you know, Grant, when we have the topic of grants on the nonprofit show, We've been doing this now for five years, nearly 1,200 episodes. So we've had a lot of discussion about grants on. And um, I got to say, Libby, this is a direction that we haven't had folks talk about. You know, it's, it's an interesting thing. And before we move on, do you find that you're unique in this approach? I don't know. <laughs> I'm out there. I'm speaking. I wrote a book. Um, I don't know. I don't, you know, I've read um, proposals for the federal government. I was a, a peer reviewer. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that, you know, the, the grants are this thick when, you, when they're submitted to the federal government, right? And so you're reading 100 pages and another 100 pages of appendices. You know, when I enjoy the grant proposal, when I see a colored picture, you know, or, or even a black and white, but it's different. And I, what I used to put into my proposals was a table of organization, and we had little pictures on the side, and it was very colorful. Whatever the topic was, we found some graphic to add in. I just wanted somebody to feel like a relief. I don't have to read this page. Let Look at this. This is so nice. You know, these are all tricks of the trade that, that I did. And, you know, I retired from teaching to run Grant Watch and write the book and, and do the podcast. Yeah. But I, I hope that what I'm, help, what I'm giving out is helping people. Yeah, I love it. Well, you know, I think um, that we need to create champions for our organization. And I think funders can become champions in that when you can go out to your community and you can say XYZ Foundation or XYZ Corporation is investing in us, that attracts other investment. We call it the cascade effect. Brilliant. So when you submit when you submit a proposal, you want to somehow squeeze in. It depends. Some things you know you have very limited uh, space. Squeeze in who's funded you before, how much money, um, and if you can even in the sentence write the results. You know who got served, who benefited, something like that. Because every grant, and I tell people, you're starting up. This is your first grant you're applying for. Okay. So apply for something small, get 500, get 1,000, get 5,000, and yeah. each time just build it, you know? Right. right. I, think you're, I think you're very wise in that because you need to understand what the process is and, and all of that. Let's go on to talking about mapping and your, your application and the implications. You mentioned that briefly when we first introduced you. What does this mean? So... Mapping means, think about a spreadsheet, an Excel spreadsheet. 
If you have a goal, now you want to have an objective for that goal. Or you could even have three objectives for that goal. You might have one goal for the entire application. You might have four, five. It really depends what you're doing. So I can't limit anyone, but don't overarch yourself. Just don't bend yourself over because, hey, the more we do, the better. No, the more you do well, the better. The more you can accomplish fully is what's best. But you want to touch on everything that they're looking for in the grant application. And so that that should guide your goals. And your program are your activities. So it, think in terms of goals, objectives, activities, evaluation. Mm -hmm. And you want to line that up. Now, after you line that up, you need to start your chart of your timeline. Is the, If the grant is a two-year grant, then you have a lot of time in the front to do planning. If it's a one-year grant, you don't have the same amount of time. Mm -hmm. And you have to see where do they want things to happen. Now, when you do your timing, you're going to go back to your objectives because your calendar needs to say when you're going to meet each objective. So as a result of, that's your activity, during the project period from here to here, for this number of children or veterans or businesses or workforce training, whatever you're going to do, you will achieve a statistically significant change, right, by this and this date as measured by. So all of these things line up. But if you don't make a map, it's not going to line up. Smart. And it seems to me like you'll be chasing things that might not really um, be rowing in the same direction of your organization, right? It needs to right. be it needs to be achievable within how your organization is structured, your team, and how you work, right? Right. And if it's only part of it is achievable, yeah, then you might have another goal to seek out additional funding to continue because maybe you can't achieve everything in a year. Right. So that could be another goal and that could be your grant writing and your, you know, and your um, fundraising. Right. It could be that you're going to do a crowdfunding project for the remainder of the money. You know, I'm not sure everything that every grant application, every subject is unique. Uh, you could be doing something for EV. You could be doing awareness of smoking. There are just so many grants out there. I mean, I just saw dairy farming the other day. So, what you know, whatever you are doing, you have to think in terms of what it is. Maybe you're cleaning up a land, you know, the area close to a landfill. So everything has to be achievable if you write an objective. And the evaluation needs to be achievable. So, and that's why I say stay away from AI in writing certain things, because if you just hand over the application to AI and say, give me a grant, well, you don't want to do that necessarily, right? right? You want to decide within your organization, this is very important, because if a grant writer puts things out there, and um, therefore the organization, if the organization gets the grant, they're signed up to do this. What if the organization never wanted to do it? Right. I love that you said that because I think that's where we get into this trap of chasing the buck. You know, we, we look at a pot of money and we're like, holy moly, that, that could change our world. And then all of a sudden we've got mission creep or we're doing something else. And we're like, wait a minute, at the core of who we are, this isn't really what we know or we can achieve it. I wrote, that I wrote, I wrote this, um, grant it was from the general services administration they had a building and you needed to show what you would do do with that building and and see if you can get it it was a matching grant and they were going to give the building and the value of what it was part of the value well i had architects come down i did all this research all the work pictures color colored pictures were inserted which was really an unreal thing at that time to put in colored pictures and print it out that way. Everything was done. We won. And then the organization had a board meeting and they decided that they were not going to raise the 250,000 that they needed to match what the government was giving in between the building and other services. So why did they spend the money on a grant writer? Yeah, that's heartbreaking. And, and yeah. I would imagine 
that's somewhat of a story that's been told over and over again. We don't have a lot of time, Libby, um, left, and, and this has been so fascinating. Can you give me some ideas about what a grant win rate should look like? If we take this strategy and we're maybe representing ourselves with this passion and communicating differently, what is the logical win rate? Because we're not going to get every grant we apply for. It's really such a variable. I won my first grant. I had never written a grant before. <laughs> I was one of four in the United States that won. It was from the Tandy Corporation, Radio Shack, oh, years yeah, ago. Yeah. Okay? Um, they wanted to, they wanted someone to prove that their Model 100, which was the first little laptop, basically, uh, we're going back to the 1980s, could be used in an educational environment. And I was teaching at the time, so it really worked out well, and I had a need for it for my class. But I've heard from people, they could send out 40 grants over time and win four. They could send out 40 and win 35. There's no rhyme or reason. And how, how can we give an answer? We don't know the skill of the grant writer. We don't know... Um, as I say, the passion of the organization. We don't know if they're going to check all the boxes because following directions is of utmost importance. Yeah. If you don't do every single thing that is listed in that document, then you're going to be set aside and they'll mm -hmm. take the ones that meet all the requirements first. And unless they need some more, will they come back to you and give you a phone call and say, hey, we like your program, but can you get that to us right away? And that does happen. I've spoken to a, a number of funding sources that are so sweet and kind because if they really like something, they'll make that phone call and they'll yeah. give them an, another opportunity. It doesn't happen with the government. I don't think they're allowed to do something like that. Right. But, you know, Libby, um, as we wrap up, it, it kind of goes back to relationship and the passion and that that building the environment and the feeling of, I want to help them. I want to be involved. I want to share that passion. And that it's shows, funny. it jumps right off the page. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm starting, I'm starting a book two. It's called, uh, where is it? The Queen of Grants to How to Grow Your Nonprofit or Business. So I'm, I started working on that. 70 pages already written. And I just want to tell the grant writers out there and grant seekers, it's discipline. That's very important. Um, set your clock, no matter what your else is going on in your life for 20 minutes a day, just to do something that's writing, because then eventually what will happen is 20 minutes becomes an hour or two. You fall into your computer. But, you know, don't look at this blank page and say, oh, I can't even start it. I don't know where to begin. If you do a little bit every day, it's not so bad. Yeah, I love it. Libby, this has been great. I have really enjoyed having you on. I'm shocked at uh, how, how different the orientation in the ecosystem of how I was taught. Um, and it, I got to tell you, Libby, it kind of breaks my heart because I feel like I missed opportunities for the organizations that I volunteered for in that capacity. By, by pulling back, right? By not by not having that commu passionate communication. So, but you're giving okay. back now. So whatever whatever didn't happen then is happening now because your show is on every day. Uh, you, you give a lot of motivation to people to continue. Uh, I love your show. You really work hard at it, and you should be commended. Well, thank you. You're very kind, Libby. High kind. So see, it fits in the name, right? Founder and CEO of it's Grant. It's spelled that way, but it but it's not Libby Hikend. Hikend. Oh, pardon me, Libby. That's Hikend. Okay. <laughs> no, Libby Hikend. I apologize. Go to uh, Libby's website, GrantWatch.com. It is so robust. You can't believe it. I mean, you will see things on them there that will like, wow just kind of rattle your cage a little bit about how much opportunity is out there if you're smart. The other we, thing is- we add, new, we add new grants every day. I, I've got to believe it. I've got to believe it because from the first time I went on it to subsequent times, it had changed and it's it's remarkable. More importantly, I, I really encourage you to check out the queen of grants from teacher to grant writer to CEO 
uh, Libby holding up that book. Good job, sister. Um, you can find it on Amazon and get it quickly to your door to help you figure out this whole role of how you and your organization can be more successful. Before we leave, people that make us successful are our partners. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraisers Friday, and your part-time controller. Thank you, everybody, so much for supporting us. Libby, we end each and every episode of the Nonprofit Show with this message. And it goes like this. To stay well so you can do well. Thanks, Libby, so much.